Hi, everybody. The one and only downside to speaking at Stanford is that I cannot use my regular introductory slide with the palm tree and sun, so you have a nighttime uh, view of Caltech instead. My research group at Caltech works to understand how electrical stimulation interfaces with neuronal circuits to bring about therapeutic relief in subjects such as people with Parkinson's through deep brain stimulation. In order to do this, we develop and use technologies for two purposes. First of all, is to achieve precise neuromodulation in terms of cell type specificity. And for this, we use optogenetics, which is the use of light responsive proteins coupled with photons they mediate currents that can either excite or inhibit neurons with a very high specificity, both temporal and spatial. However, for us to use optogenetics efficiently, we need to be able to know which pathways we have to target. And this is rather challenging because in many cases, the, the brain stimulation mediates effects brain-wide. So we want to be able to map long-range projections throughout the brain. And for this purpose, we develop and use tissue clearing, also one form of them being known as clarity. Deep brain stimulation is uh, a relatively new modality, especially from some of the non-motor indications. It's been introduced in 93 for Parkinson. It's also used for tremor and dystonia. There's many patients benefiting from it. However, there's interesting side effects depending on the placement of the electrode. So what you see here is the electrode is placed in a deep brain structure. If the electrode is lateral, that brings about motor relief. The patients can move and the tremor stops. However, if the electrode is instead medial, patients have been noted to report some interesting side effects, such as a desire to go to Vegas and gamble all their money, or inappropriate behavior and social conduct, which speaks to the fact that this nucleus, this deep brain nucleus, has highly intermingled pathways, some of them responsible for motor control, but some other responsible for mood or cognitive uh, functions. And what we want to achieve is precise modulation all of, only of the intended pathways to bypass the side effects and to achieve the best out of therapy. And it's very important that we understand how it works. And despite a lot of research, both clinical and basic, we are still far from a deep, de deep understanding on how deep brain stimulation works. And this is very important because in 2009 has been a, a proof for obsessive compulsive disorder and is also cons uh, considered for depression. So we try to understand how this works. The challenge in getting to a mechanistic understanding on deep brain stimulation is that electrical stimulation is a non-specific modality. You affect inhibitory neurons, excitatory cells of support, even vasculature. So in order to understand the circuit elements responsible for the therapeutic effects, we used optogenetics. We used excitatory opsins or inhibitory opsins to modulate cell bodies at the electrode tip and understand which combination, which circuits or combination of circuits would bring the therapeutic effects. We were in for a big surprise. After a lot of work, um, we came to the understanding that modulating the cell bodies at the electrode tip was not effective in bringing about the therapeutic effects. Instead, what mattered was modulating the pathways, the axonal fibers in the area, which were, interestingly, originating from superficial areas of the brain. And this has huge implications for therapy, because one reason to exclude patients is hemorrhage. The deeper your target, the more challenging the surgery is. This shows you a walking path from a rodent without any modulation, so it's a, a motor deficit. And when you turn the light on, but interestingly, not to modulate the deep nuclei, but instead to modulate superficial areas that we think are the origin of those fibers that go at the electrode site, this was able to replicate the therapeutic benefit. Interestingly, this pathway spans pretty much the entire brain. And we came to this understanding by doing paired recordings and optogenetic modulation. So what this shows you is a hyperdirect pathway pathway originating from the superficial layers of the cortex, broadly distributed, that funnel down into the target for deep brain stimulation. Interestingly, though, although this is exciting by pointing to more superficial areas that could be interfered with, one needs to step back and think, this is a mouse brain. How much of this knowledge can we carry and how much can we extrapolate to the, uh, to the human brain? Interestingly, though, we had help in this. Uh, Dr. Jamie Henderson, who leads the DBS clinic at Stanford, uh, wanted to see whether this pathway that we highlighted in mice using optogenetics is present in humans. So what you see here is a scan highlighting axons 
that originate from the cortex and funnel through the subthalamic nucleus. The pathway is there, and even more interestingly, when the electrode was placed in the subthalamic nucleus, an electrode array placed on the su surface of the brain was able to pick up activity from those cell bodies. So the pathway is there, however you can observe is rather diffuse. So if you remember my point about side effects, you can see that some uh, of these pathways come from prefrontal areas, which are commonly thought to be involved in cognition and higher level processing, while some other pathways come from motor and, and sensory areas, which could mediate uh, motor behavior. So what's interesting is, do we have ways to separate these and interface with them in a highly specific fashion? You see the pathways are all uh, rendered in the same color, which is a gross oversimplification. These are different cell types mediating different actions and most likely responsible for different neurotransmitters. We would like to understand what these are, and we would like to map them brain-wide. However, this is rather difficult, because when you try to look to mammalian tissue, this is what you see. You don't have optical access. And if we could have optical access, we could start to visualize these long-ranging pathways and try to identify them and see where we could put our stimulators for the highest precision and uh, least side effects. This came in the form of tissue clearing. The main culprits in our ability to see through mammalian tissue is lipids. They scatter light. One could remove the lipids to gain optical access. However, when this is done, the tissue collapses. It loses its 3D shape. So what you have to do beforehand is to introduce a supportive hydrogel. So this shows uh, the concept of clarity, where you can introduce a hydrogel, cross-link all proteins of interest to the hydrogel, and only afterwards introduce detergents that can and flush out the lipids. So now you have optical access through the tissue. And when you have optical access through the tissue, you can start imaging wall brain with very high resolution and increasing resolution to the level of synapses. And going back to our challenge, how can we map pathways, long-range projection pathways? With conventional histology, this is a rather impossible task because we have to section the tissue in 40 micrometer thin slices. And when you try to think about realigning these fibers, and what you'll appreciate in a second here is that these are dense fibers, and the likelihood of misaligning them is rather high, even with the most accuracy imaging. What you can notice here is also that this is um, highly dense, difficult to analyze, a big data problem. This is not the movie that crushed the computers. That's still upcoming. <laughs> so the challenge is, how do we advance the technologies to help computation? This is where my group is focused on, not necessarily on big data analysis, but on advancing the tools so big data analysis becomes easier. And one focus for this goal is to generate delivery vectors that could deliver multiple colors or multiple labels brain-wide. And we do this by recruiting the vasculature, because we want to achieve this in non-transgenic models as well. So what we were able to do was to take one adeno-associated viral serotype that had very poor infectivity brain-wide and modify it by using uh, capsid engineering and achieve very high transduction of the brain, again, only with systemic injection through the vasculature. So now you can envision modifying your genes and achieving a scenario like this, where you label your circuits of interest with multiple colors. However, tissue clearing is not limited to the brain. Indeed, there are possibilities outside the brain, and they're equally interesting. And we've explored with the use of vasculature to create transparent organisms. So what we are able to do is to diffuse in the hydrogel monomers and the fixatives and also the detergents to generate entire transparent organisms. And through the use of vasculature, you can also diffuse in dyes. So when this happens, this is the kind of data you can obtain. This is a whole kidney. Kidneys, they have about a million of uh, nephrons, very, very tiny structures that are responsible to filtering our blood from waste. And those are very fragile, and they are the ones usually involved in uh, kidneypathies. They're very difficult to observe, and you'll see in a bit why. Um, so what you see here is, through the vasculature, not only we deliver the supportive hydrogel, but we deliver labels for tubulin, so antibodies, and also for DNA, for nucleic acids. So now you can start to visualize, but not only have optical access, also have macromolecule access for labeling purposes. And you can start to visualize entire organs and see the distribution of rare cells or rare therapeutics. And this points to very exciting possibilities 
The one related to neuroscience is mapping the peripheral nervous system. Because of its spread, it's rather impossible to undertake such a task with conventional histology. So now with tissue clearing, we could do that. However, there are other exciting possibilities, such as looking at bacterial infections, heterogeneity in distribution to the, to the body. So, uh, you can think, for example, cystic fibrosis. You can look at gene therapies, delivery of viral vectors, sparse cells, such as HIV or stem cells or tumors that uh, cover large volume or breaches in blood-brain barrier. However, I should, this is a big data challenge, and I should highlight that our ability to clear and image such large volumes introduced the biggest challenge in data analysis yet. This, for, to image a, a brain with many channels can be many terabytes of data, and even rendering them for such videos in 3D is a big challenge, let alone extracting useful information. And I will show you where we are now. Um, this is a rendering from a very small volume in the spinal cord, motor neurons here, labeled with the AAV approach that I told you about. And this uh, rendering was performed with the Imaris filament tracer. What I want to highlight, though, is that this took a tremendous amount of work. It's not fully automated, and it's a very modest volume. So we would like to be able to take these modalities and expand them to be able to cope with the large volume of data that's involved uh, from tissue clearing experiments and also optogenetic experiments. This might look impressive, but we are far from what we would like to achieve. So this is a challenge for the community working on big data to synergize with technology developers to bypass such challenges. Thank you very much.